The pride, passion, and pageantry of college football lives here. This is the Paul Feinbaum Show Hour 2 Podcast. We're back. Second hour. First hour was pretty exciting. A lot of NIL talk, a lot lot of on-the-field talk. We're joined now by Rick Carl, the sports business expert. And Rick, thanks for being here. I know you've uh, dug deep into this NIL situation. Was that a, you were at a conference on Wednesday? What are you learning about where we are right now and where are we going? That I'm confused, <laughs> and we need a lot more lawyers to deal with this. <laughs> but I'm confused in a good way because fundamentally, if we don't have all the answers, it probably means the free market will have a hand in all of this, like everything else in our economy. Looks like there are three ways to go. First, let's call it the Bo Nix. Miles Brennan example, where you get the endorsements to the quarterback and the rest of the locker room gets upset. Uh, The second way is let's call it the University of Miami model, where you have guys only in Miami, right? Where you have guys being paid uh, a a small amount over time, but it comes out of a half a million dollar sponsorship and everybody gets the dollars. And then the third way is leave it to the states. 27 of them have passed an IL law, 16 already in effect. And that may deal with Every conference, every level of sport, every division, every man, women in niche sports, big sports, small sports. But it is free market. And remember when uh, President Emmert a year and a half ago issued a statement. What did I say on the show? Well, the devil's in the details. Well, the devil's still in the details. And it came to be July 1. And they said, all right, courts ruled. Uh, We don't know what we can really do to govern. So let's just let it happen and see what happens. That's exactly where we are. Uh, from your standpoint, and I understand what you're saying about the market, but what, what, what are your biggest concerns right now? Yeah, well, there are a lot. The, well, the, the, the first one is uncertainty and lack of standardization. If you don't have a set of rules, whether they level the playing field or not, it's going to give the schools with the tremendous resources the advantages to step in and do this deal over somebody else that doesn't have the resources. So we understand that. But the uncertainty itself is an issue. You know, philosophically, are you going to allow the Miami approach? Well, why not? Because it guarantees kind of that everybody's going to get dollars. Uh, Will you uh, accept the fact that big-time athletes ought to get more? Well, maybe, but it's certainly going to foster some uh, uh, some problems on the tennis courts and the golf courses and the swimming pools of college athletics. So it's uncertainty plus the lack of standards, which leads to more uncertainty. Talking to, to Rick Carl, Rick, uh, just in terms of what you're seeing from the, from the business side of it, the Miami case being the outlier, but, but how often do you think we'll see something like that where, where one individual puts up significant money? Well, it is the outlier because it's the first. But, you know, you ask me that the next couple of months, I'm not so sure it's the outlier. I think uh, every athletic di- director is going to attempt to try to figure out how to get those kind of sponsors to the table in categories where they haven't existed before. And so that's new money for the program, but it also eliminates the AD's decision on how to allocate it back to the students. You know, does a third-string guard get less money than a quarterback? I hope not. Uh, even though the quarterback brings more attention to the to the school, so I think it is an outlier, but I do see that as a trend. Rick, this is not like the federal government, where if you know if, if they're broke, they just you know keep spending. Uh, if if Booster starts put, putting income and and, and disposable income or or, or whatever, however they want to classify it into individuals, do you think that has any effect on the university? in the athletic department uh, in a different category, that that money won't be going to them, but it'll be going to the individual players? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, you know, where, where do the boosters uh, make their money to get bo- to be boosters? Usually, they run successful businesses. So now we have another opportunity for those individuals to create endorsement sponsorships that benefit the school, benefit their favorite quarterback, benefit the program, but yet is all legal and called for and adds to the inequality between the haves and the have-nots. And I'm not saying that's wrong or right. It's too late for that. (laughs) 
we could have argued that before July 1. Rick, let me uh, go back two, three weeks ago to the Alston ruling, and I know they're, they're, they're connected, but not directly. What, what are you hearing on that? Right. And I know there are more suits being filed, and, and where do you see that going? Yeah, that's a very interesting point, by the way, and, and nobody really focuses on it, uh, because they're not, it, it's not be-all and end-all. They are connected, but not automatically. Remember, that's a case that decided whether benefits tethered to education, that's the words they used again, are legal and could they be used? The answer is, yeah, they should be, and they're not uh, prohibited. And in fact, anybody who tries to prohibit it violates the antitrust laws. And so this is computers. This is uh, trips uh, for extended study somewhere. Uh, This is other benefits to learning. And if there's a connection to learning, there is no limitation that's legal under the antitrust laws. So you may have gold-plated computers. You may have a trip to Venice for, a, for a, 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 an extended study program. That's uh, separate in a way from NIL, but it's exactly the same issues as NIL. How do you get a competitive advantage? How do you get kids to feel like they're having a special treatment for going to school? And I can guarantee you, by the way, that there will be agents who are listening to this. They don't need me, but they're doing it on their own to line up in front of the next eighth-grade superstars and put the contract hand out. Rick, let me switch to the Olympics. Uh, Announced today in Tokyo, no spectators. Uh, We think of this as a television event as long as NBC has something to show, all is good. But you've been to a number of these Olympics. You know how much schmoozing and business goes on. This was already going to to be limited, but how how is this decision today going to affect uh, the the business side of, of the Summer Games? The first schmoozeless Olympics since they held it at the Parthenon in, what, uh, 600 <laughs> B.C. Uh, I think, you know, when you when you realize, I was at the Stanley Cup Finals last night, and the, uh, no secret, the NBC guys were there. It's their last time with NBC, uh, and obviously ESPN taken over. But they're going straight from Tampa to, uh, to Tokyo, and I'll tell you, it's not pretty. Got a quarantine for 14 days. Uh, all the business people they would have taken, they're not taken even before the decision not to have spectators. And so it's how do you get through it just by television? Well, if you do, there is billions on the table from advertisers and TV that they wouldn't have had had they not had these games. And let's not remember, let's remember we don't have a, a long memory to realize that six months ago we were totally used to spectatorless games. Well, you better get used to it again. By the way, one quick thing. I know we may be running out of time. I'm sitting here in front of one of your properties, Disney's. Tonight's National Spelling Bee. It's, my, it's off my bucket list. It's the first time I've ever covered it. So I'm memorizing the Webster Dictionary, and by 8 o'clock, I'm going to see if I can enter. I'm going to get a passport to say I'm under 14. I need the 50 grand. What do you think? Yeah, no, you do. I mean, you, you, you probably charge that an hour, uh, being a Harvard uh, guy like you. <laughs> hey, Rick, thank you so much. Enjoy it. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs> Rick Harrell joining us uh, from the Spelling Bee. That is tonight, and I'm glad he told me because I did not know. Uh, we will take a break. More of your phone calls at 855-242-7285. We have a long way to go. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Fighting in the cage commands bravery. It requires hard work and belief above all else it demands preparation and when the ufc's number one lightweight contender dustin poirier prepares for his fights he reaches for celsius celsius gives you the essential energy you need to push harder than yesterday celsius essential energy live fit do you own or rent your home sure you do and i bet it can be hard work you know it's easy bundling policies with geico GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. Hey, uh, just calling um, after listening to Heather earlier there. Just, uh, uh, I'm not buying the Iowa State deal. Uh, I think we heard the same things last year about them, and don't they have to beat Iowa first? You know, make sure they don't lose to Louisiana's and uh, and so on to make it before they get into the college playoff. 
Yeah, I mean, they, they had some problems there. Last, I mean, they're, they're a good program, but, you know, it's one thing being a good program. It's another thing being a great program, and they've yet to prove that. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm a big fan of Matt Campbell, but uh, I just, uh, you know, it's the Joes that uh, they're going to get you there, not uh, Yeah, I mean, they, uh, the I mean, looking at their schedule, I mean, the Iowa games at home, uh, you know, they should win that game. I, you know, after that, they have Oklahoma State at home. They go to Morgantown, uh, they have Texas at home, and they're at Norman. Uh, so they have a good schedule, but I don't see them winning at Oklahoma. And then I, I'm not even sure. So you lose to Oklahoma, and and then you come around and beat them the, three weeks later. Does that really matter that much? What, what else? I mean, you, who have you played? Yeah, uh, I agree. I mean, they've got to do uh, – I mean, I mean, Iowa is your best more. non-conference game. That's not That's not – going to get it get it done i also disagree with her on her uh, prediction for florida i mean i i would agree that georgia's the favorite in the east but uh to say florida's not even a top 25 yeah that was uh, uh <laughs> that was pretty strong yeah I, i'd say so uh i think uh got to give emory jones and those guys a little bit more credit i think uh i definitely think we're a top 20 team and uh and I, I'm definitely expecting that. Well, thank you for the call, and it's really nice of you to uh, – to, to, and, and what, what we're talking about there with, with, uh, with Bruce is Heather Dinich, who was on earlier, and, uh, and she had some she, – she said this, and I'll just quote her again, the SEC East is one of the weakest divisions in college football. She said the Big 12 has a better chance of getting two in the CFP than the SEC. She likes OU and Iowa State. And as Bruce just said, she said – Florida is not in her preseason top 25. Heather Dinich of ESPN with those comments. If you want to react to that or anything else, 855-242-7285. Let's get some uh, more calls here. And I mentioned uh, we'll head to Alabama in a little while to get an update on the Tide. How about Tom, who is up next? Uh, hey, Tom. Hey, Paul. How you doing? Anyway, uh, I think Heather's wrong. I think the East is going to be a little bit stronger than she thinks. Uh, of course, it's not going to be Tennessee and Vandy going to be much help, or maybe not Missouri, but, you know, you Kentucky, Florida, Georgia, come on, man, they're going to be good. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. Uh, and listen, that's her opinion. Good for her. Uh, we have a show here with, with four hours to react to it. All right. Well, I'm reacting to it. And they also had, hey, I caught a friend of mine that uh, played lineman up there in the early 70s, and his Friend played running much a Steve Cohn and uh, uh, Bill uh, Rudder, his tailback, you know, played right. for a while. I'm going to remember. I've been before your time or whatnot, but uh, we were laughing and joking. They both said that uh, uh, they would definitely be sm- uh, Smoky Mountain Market spokesmen and, uh, or Sam and Andy's. I do remember those places. Mm, okay, well, uh, hmm. Thank you for taking my call. Yeah, it's great to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, how about uh, David, who is calling next? Uh, hey, David. Hey, uh, good afternoon, sir. How are you? I am doing great. Thank you for calling. Sir, I'm just calling in regard to your question about former college players that might have profited hugely off the NIL. And I, as I listened, nobody said, I said Brian Bosworth from Oklahoma. No, yeah, but, yeah. But for those who were wondering, I, I asked a question earlier, and we can do this the entire show. You know, it doesn't matter what what era. Who who do you think would have made the most money? We went back to Namath and Stabler. Uh, you know, the seventies players. Uh, you know, Boz, Boz, Cam, uh, Boz, Bo Jackson in the eighties. Uh, Tebow. Uh, there, there, there's so many possibilities, but but you're the first one to bring Bosworth up. I just, you know, I remember watching the. In the 80s, playing for Oklahoma, you know, his hairstyles, his outrageousness, and that shirt he wore at the Rose Bowl. He could have trademarked that and probably lived the rest of his life off the money of that. No, you're right. It's, uh, yeah. it, it's, such, a good, uh, it's, it's such a good suggestion. I, mean, I can't believe nobody has brought him up until now. Well, I appreciate that. And I just had one more thought on the sure. NIL. I, I've heard your previous guests, some of the ones who are setting up to help the athletes learn how to navigate that i never heard i I assume those guys are getting money for doing that correct 
Yes. The yeah. agencies there. Exactly. Yeah. So they're they're also set to make a profit off the player. So I just I would like the listeners to remember that when these guys come up and say how good they're going to be, that you know they're getting paid. <laughs> And that's You're it. right. Hey, thank you. Have a great and, let me, and let's get. Uh, thank you very much for the call. Let me get back to that in a minute. We have some time here, uh, it, because it. We're now a week in and a day into the NIL conversation, and it's one thing to reflect back on which players in history would have made the most money, but but I'm curious to all of you, especially business owners. Uh, I mean, how far would you go with this? Uh, it's one thing to help your your. It's one thing to help your program out. And many alums are called on to give in some way, whether it's by tickets or paying a licensing fee or a premium. I mean, there's, there are a lot of ways to support your school. But if you're, if you're a businessman in a, in a college town or in a community, are you really helping your, your school by doing essentially a personal services contract with a player it, does that help your university or does it take away uh, like this guy in miami five hundred and forty thousand dollars this gym owner everybody's getting a uh, everybody's getting something from it with the university uh, is that five hundred thousand dollars that the university of miami is not getting from him I mean, think about that for a second. If, if you're an athletic director, if you are a fundraiser, I've asked a couple of people this question. I, I can't get an answer yet. Is money to the players coming out of your, your bottom line? If, you're, if, if the University of Tennessee, which always seems to have some type of fun, building fund, primarily because they've had to pay so many coaches off, if, if you're at the University of Tennessee, and you're, you've got a campaign for the university, uh, for the athletic department, you're trying to bury debt, and then some wealthy fat cat who owns some big business in town decides to spend 100000 200000 however many thousand on an individual player or players, does that, does that hurt the school? I mean, I mean there, there's unintended consequences for everything uh, and by the way, it's it's it's, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's it's everybody's out for themselves. But I'm but I'm wondering, while the while the individual player is is being helped, and ultimately maybe the school is being helped if if this is used as, as a recruiting tool, is it adversely affecting the university? I'd like somebody to opine on that. A couple of things out there right now. We have that. We're, we're going back in time in terms of, you know, whatever era you, you, you care to remember, from whatever era you want to choose, which player at, at, at your favorite school do you think would have done the best? We've had Brian Bosworth mentioned, Cam has been mentioned, Tebow, Johnny Football, Reggie Bush. Who are some of the most popular players? Z Zion, obviously, in in basketball but let's let's keep this to football johnny musso from the 70s at alabama archie can you imagine what archie manning would have commanded in mississippi in the late 60s pete maravich i know i just violated my rule about basketball but i couldn't resist pete maravich the honey badger was mentioned so many so many possibilities and again, we're only talking about today in terms of the reality of this, but uh, we'll get into that. We'll, we'll keep that on the board the entire show. We still have two and a half hours to go. I mentioned uh, we've had Heather on already, and uh, she has <laughs> she has definitely stirred it up. Uh, we will t we had Ricardo and Stephen M. Smith joining us in a minute. Uh, Blake Topmeyer a little bit later on. Darren Heitner, who is uh, very deep in the woods on. NIL story that just came out interestingly some University of North Carolina players who were interv interviewed by ESPN who would have no chance of ever going to the playoffs under the under the current system none they are against the 12 team playoff 
Mac Brown said today that during a team discussion about the uh, 12 team playoff, his players were against the format, preferred six to eight teams. <laughs> Max said that the new, uh, the new ACC commissioner, Jim Phillips, had asked all the coaches to get feedback from players. So the UNC players, who have a snowball's chance in you-know-where of making it under the current setup, but could get in there with a 12-team, are against it. I thought North Carolina was a smart school. More of your phone calls at 855-242-7285. We are coming back with many more guests and your phone calls right after this. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Hey, this is Bomani Jones. What's your favorite podcast? Let me tell you why that'll be number two after you listen to mine. Three times a week, I'm going to challenge you to keep up with me as I discuss topics from the latest in technology and music. And people getting dunked on. Also, you'll get the very best analysis of the games, and we watch them with encyclopedic level historical connection. Plus, we have got a community of guests that you'll feel like are your closest friends in no time. Listen and subscribe to The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. We welcome you back on a very busy Thursday afternoon. More of your phone calls in a few minutes at 855 242 Seven two eight five, and it's uh, great to welcome back to the show Stephen M. Smith of Touchdown Alabama to find out what uh, is happening with the Crimson Tide. Stephen, uh, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Paul. How, how are we feeling in this uh, month of July? We're doing okay. What about the Tide? Uh, are they ready to roll? They ready to roll. Are they ready to get back out to the fall camp? I'm ready to roll with them. So I'm just patiently waiting on August to get here. (laughs) Well, let's start uh, at the quarterback position. And uh, we we know Bryce Young uh, is the expected uh, winner of that competition. Uh, Give us give us uh, the details. Well, right now with Bryce uh, had a really good spring, Paul, as as we all saw that uh, in the A day game over 300 yards passing with one touchdown took command of the huddle in terms of his leadership and being a more so of a vocal guy in that room. Uh, uh, he's kind of got that chill uh, ca- uh, California swag to him, which means he doesn't get serious too often. But when he does get serious, when he recognizes that, you know, playtime is over, it's time to get to work, he has the ability to turn that serious button on there and the players around him understand, hey, you know, Bryce is serious. He's about to play on the field. He's about this offense. He's about winning. Let's get down to business and let's get to work. So really excited to see what he can be able to do on the field in terms of of the playmaking ability. And also just the marriage of he and Bill O'Brien together as offensive coordinator and quarterback. Can Bill O'Brien put Bryce in situations where the young man from California can make those plays as he tries to become the fifth player to be a first-year starting quarterback in taking Alabama to a national championship. I know there was a. I know at one time you thought uh, there could be some legitimate competition. Uh, there may be competition for the second position, though. Break that down. Well, right now the, the number two guy, the number two guy to me is definitely Paul Tyson. Jalen Milrow has a lot of ability. Don't get me wrong, very good runner. Uh, can throw the ball. Of course, uh, Saban and Ben O'Brien are trying to get him to be a more polished passer of the football. But right now, the number two guy, Paul Tyson, been in here now, going on his third season, really nice the size on him at 6'5", a little bit over 230 pounds now. Got a very, very, very good arm to his game. Uh, I know to go back and you watch the spring game, people look at, well, Paul didn't do the things that Bryce did. But you have to take Paul's spring game in the context due to, you know, Tyson had, you know, the second team offensive line, a patchwork group, you know, guys, you know, he suffered some drop passes there, some penalties happened on the field, but you still saw Tyson fit the ball in the tight windows, show very strong accuracy, whether he was throwing the ball to Asia Hall, of a true freshman receiver, Jace McClellan at running back, just dumping the ball down and stretching the ball out to a number of different targets. He's got the size. 
He's got the ability to process so much information out there on the field, and he's got the arm ability to not just be accurate, but shoot the ball out there as well. I think Tyson's the number two guy. Let's move on. Uh, we know what has departed from a wide receiver standpoint, but what's, uh, what's the current crop look like? Well, right now the number one guy is John Mechie Pong, and he steps into a situation where Julio Jones and Amari Cooper and Calvin Ridley and guys like that before him have had, which is being the number one guy in that room. And he's got the tall task of leading this group of receivers and building that chemistry or working that chemistry with Bryce Young. Now, Mechie last year had a lot of, had some explosive plays, you know, 55 touches, like 900 yards and six touchdowns. So he's the number one guy behind him. Uh, uh, Jamison Williams, this transfer from Ohio State, has come in here, Paul. He's turned it up in seven-on-seven. Seven. He's turned it up in some of the workouts. The, the coaching staff, the teammates around him, around here in, in this program, very impressed by that young man. Uh, he's had, he's got experience coming from the Buckeyes. Of course, he had the touchdown catch there from uh, Justin Fields in the semifinal game against Clemson. Uh, the Buckeyes taking that matchup 49-28, to 28, so definitely keep your eyes on Jamison Williams. But th- the number three guy, it's going to be very interesting because right now Slay Bolden's got experience, and he was starting to step up through the latter portion of last season. I really like Slay Bolden. But you also have some young guys. When you look at a, when you look at a, a Trayshawn Holden, a Javon Baker, a Thayu Jones Bell, an Asia Hall, a Christian Leary, a JoJo Earl, just a lot of young guys in there battling with Slay Bolden for that third spot. He's kind of he's kind of maintaining his own right now. But if I look at this room, you've got uh, John Mechie, absolutely number one, uh, Jamison Williams two, and number three Slay Bolden trying to trying to battle off some young guys. Talking to Stephen M. Smith from Touchdown Alabama. Stephen M., let's let's talk about newer players, uh, impact freshmen, people that that maybe uh, only the insiders know about, but the average fan doesn't. Who who's going to shine this fall? As far as the, as far as the new impact players go, number one, I got to go right to that wide receiver room. Aja Hall in the spring game gave me kind of glimpses of Julio Jones. And I know that's huge praise right there, but Hall at 6'3", you know, 195 pounds from South Florida. And this got big, rangy, athletic, huge catch radius, made a lot of contested catches, big speed, got a stiff arm to him. And I remember when um, uh, Kirk Herbstreet and Joey Galloway were both on the, on the field with Coach Saban. You know, Saban talked about it. This guy right here, Hall, 17, keep your eyes on this kid. We're trying to get him the ball as much as possible. Along with him, I look at another freshman in JoJo Earl at wide receiver who came in this summer. Just fast, quick, twitchy, quick, twitchy, explosive athlete. And when I watch him play, he's kind of Jalen Waddle 2.0 in a sense of you put this young man on special teams, kickoff return, punt return, he's going to make a lot of magic that will happen for you on that side of the ball and that aspect of the game. And after losing to Jamin Waddle, you got to have a, a JoJo Earl on the field in that, in, that, in that aspect there. Another guy, I'm going to turn to the offensive line here, Paul, and I'm going to look at J.C. Latham, uh, the five-star offensive tackle who came in in this class, and a guy that's 6'6", you know, 320 pounds, got a lot of size, physicality, a quickness to him. Uh, um, I, I think Coach Saban really wants to see can he take that starting job at right tackle as Alabama transitions to Evan Neal over to left tackle. And then defensively, uh, got to be cool, mate. McKinstry uh, came in this summer, had a bit, not the spring, excuse me, had a very good spring, had an interception in the spring game, had a fumble recovery in the matchup as well. Cocky guy, but a confident guy. Plays with leverage, plays with skill, plays with a lot of ability and a lot of, and a lot of uh, instinct there. So, Kool Aid McKinstry on defense, offensively, JoJo Earl, Asia Hall, and of course, uh, JC Latham on that offensive line. Stephen, before you go, uh, I keep hearing uh, from my friends like you about this defense. And, you know, Alabama has not had what I would call an elite defense, at least in a couple of years. Will this be in that category? How good are they? 
this is going to be a very scary group. And, and this group has been looking for this moment the last three years. I think they've been hearing you're no longer good, you're no longer dominant, you're no longer tough, nobody's afraid of you. This group will be playing with its hair on fire, led by Christian Harris, you know, Will Anderson back. You're bringing a Henry Tooto from Tennessee. Uh, this group, Paul, will be playing with a massive hair on fire. I, I'll say this. This group will be really, really close to that 2016 group that Alabama had with Jonathan Allen and Ryan Anderson, Tim Williams, uh, Micah Fitzpatrick, Reuben Foster. This year's group will be very close to that scary, wild 2016 group. <laughs> I'm afraid to ask you the next question because it may seem so obvious, but uh, any doubt about this team beginning the season or maybe even ending at number one? I don't have, I don't have any doubts about it, Paul. However, there, there are two games I will look at. The game against Florida and the Swamp is going to be very intriguing because Emory Jones, Emory Jones can play. That young dude can play. And this is a damn Mullen type of quarterback, very good runner, but can shoot the ball out there, throwing the ball as well. Yes, they've lost a lot of pieces offensively to the NFL, but like Emory Jones, that game in Florida could be very interesting. If I even look at, I know people are going to laugh, but that Iron Bowl is going to be interesting. Iron this Bowl. Ball, this is why Paul, when Auburn's had a first-year head coach, they come out hyper-aggressive. Remember 2009 Gene Chizik? Remember that, Paul? They had, to, they had to end around the end-around player, Terrell Zachary, had the built-in uh, trick, had the built-in onside kick, came back and scored again. Yes, Auburn lost that game, but they came out hyper-aggressive with hyper-aggressive with Chizik, hyper-aggressive with Gus Malzahn, Brian Harson coming out from Boise State. You don't know what his strategy is. You don't know what his scheme is. You don't know what his M.O. is. So he can be hyper-aggressive as well. Also, Jordan Hare Stadium – it's one of the only places where when Nick Saban touches his foot down, there's no fear from that environment. Alabama suffered a loss in Jordan here in 2013. Suffered a loss there in 2017. Suffered a loss there in 2019. I'm not saying Auburn wins the game, but I am saying Jordan Hare Stadium is one of those events where Nick Saban has not quite physically just automatically dominated. Man, that, I, I was counting on a lot of things from you today, but I wasn't counting on that. Stephen M., never, never, never a dull moment with you. Come back soon. All the best. Appreciate it, Paul. Take care. You got it. The one and only Stephen M. Smith from Touchdown Alabama saying, watch out for the Auburn Tigers in the Iron Bowl. We are coming back. We'll get your reaction to all of that after this. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. This is DC and RC. I'm Daniel Cormier. I'm a former two-division UFC champion, and I'm a bad mamma jamma. <laughs> yes, he is, and I'm Ryan Clark, former Super Bowl champ. Be sure to follow our new podcast wherever you can. We're going to talk MMA. We're going to talk sports, life. We're just going to have a great time. It's going to be a ton of fun. It's going to be fun, RC. DC and RC is ready to roll. Guys, that's DC and RC. You need to follow wherever you listen to all your podcasts. We are back here on a Thursday afternoon, taking your calls. A lot of guests are dropping by as well, but right now we uh, check in with Cody, who is up next. Uh, hey, Cody. Hi, Paul. How are you? We are great. Thank you for calling. Hi. Hey, uh, I'm the name, image, and likeness of the old players. What do you think about Derek Thomas, Alabama? Uh, yeah, he would. Uh, I mean, first of all, he. He was an exciting guy. He was likable, engaging. I think he would have done extremely well. He was all, all, also one of my favorite players at Alabama, so I'm, I'm, I'm all over him. Hey, I got a question. Uh, if the callers of the Fine Bum Show got paid for name, image, and likeness, who would? Who now, you now okay, you, you've you've just given us the best question of the week, uh, and uh, I am I'd, going. I'd have to say Legend or Larry. Okay, let's let's throw that out there for for the next two days. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna use your question. I'm gonna pay you, by the way, Cody, for coming up with it. <laughs> and uh, Cody just asked the best question I've heard since NIL. If Feinbaum callers were athletes and were able to con to collect, who would be the top five? Uh, so you say Legend. Who else? Legend and Larry would be my two 
Favorite. Legend and uh, Larry. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just, I just hit myself over the head with a telephone book. I can't believe, it, not, not that you can find one anymore, but I, 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 I can't believe I didn't think of that one. That is such a great question. And, uh, you know, I'm a big Alabama man, but uh, also I like Tammy's calls. And I, I miss Tammy uh, being on the show. But, Tammy would have made a lot uh, of money. She been, yeah, she would have been in my top five uh, for sure. Uh, even Charles from Real Town, I get a kick out of him too. So, um, I can't remember the guy's name that uh, was from Bessemer. Uh, he they enjoy his calls. Uh, Charles Allen Head. Oh like yeah, hey, where where you where are you from, uh, Cody? I'm from Tallapoosa County. Uh, okay, I just want to make sure you get you get proper County. credit from this because this is the best question of the week. <laughs> now Tallapoosa, is that's uh, is that in East Alabama? That is, uh, yes, uh, Central, East Central Alabama, yeah. It's East right Central, next okay. To Talladega. Talladega, yeah. Yeah, that's where, uh, Pirelli Owood is from. Oh, okay. I live in that same little town. I, I know I know that area. Hey, well, thank you, Cody. That is such a great question. We're gonna, we are going to let that one marinate, and uh, we're gonna spend the rest of not not the rest. We have a lot of guests, but for the next two days, we'll we'll crown a champion by uh, seven o'clock tomorrow night. Uh, we'll that that is such a great question. Uh, I can't believe we haven't thought of it uh, until now. Ashton is up next. Uh, Ashton, go right ahead. Hi, Paul. How you doing? We are doing well, thank you. Uh, Two points. Number one point, I don't think anybody in the NIL would, could have ever touched Deion Sanders. He too much a player. Everything he brought to the table would have been amazing. So that brings my second point. If you're a coach in college football, and you now it's hard enough to coach 18 to 21-year-olds, and now you may have 18 to 21-year-olds with ten, a $100,000, a $1 million, to me that becomes a concern for college coaches. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but so how do you deal with that one? Well, uh, it's going to be uh, – I just think the coaches already are going to have a tough time coaching kids, you know, at that age group. And then now a kid comes there and he gets a lot of money and you're counting on him and he say, well, you know what, I've got my money, I'll, I'll move on. I'll go into the transfer portal and go somewhere else. It, it is – there are so many – unanswered questions about this now i think some of the questions and i've even brought them up about conflicts i don't think are going to happen but players right now especially those who start making a little bit of money or i mean let's just think about think about all of us the first time you made money i mean i first time oh, yeah. i ever made any money i was working at mcdonald's uh, most of us were you know in our teens uh, we may have been younger we may have been older but uh, I mean, the idea of, 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 of being however, you know, whether it's 15, 16, 17, 18, you know, having money for the first time, uh, it does things to you and you start doing, you start reacting differently. And, and 18 to 21 year olds, you know, their decision making process is not the best. Yeah, and I would agree. I would, I would think back on my life and I bet you would be, agree that uh, uh, that was probably I the agree. worst period of my life for decision making. <laughs> Uh, uh, exactly, and now their their pockets are full of money. I just I, and then as they get full of money, you know, the other people that come around college athletes, it just it seems like it's going to be difficult. The coach already has to fight so much just to keep these kids online, and then now this is just added pressure for me and my eyes for the college coaches that are trying to raise these young men and get them a degree or get them a chance to go into the NFL or whatever. And now I just think as an obstacle that the coaches eventually are going to have another headache on their hands no there's no question hey uh, really good question thank you so much for the call we are heading to the top of the hour more of your phone calls right after this thank you for listening to the paul feinbaum show podcast the paul feinbaum show airs weekdays on the sec network beginning at 3 eastern do you own or rent your home sure you do Fortunately, GEICO makes it easy to bundle your home and car insurance. It's a good thing, too, because having a home is hard work. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. GEICO.com. Easy.